All right, so today we're talking about pulling data from more than one table. And, you know, the title says querying two or more tables. Usually when you're doing joins, you're querying many tables at once. Uh, SQL gives us two ways of achieving this goal. The first one is a subquery. The other one is the join. Um, I'm going to start with the subquery first. And then I'll take on the joins because the joins actually the one that's a little more challenging of the two to understand. Um, although they both work with multiple tables, they do serve different purposes and they have different costs and challenges associated with them. So if you remember the lecture last week, two weeks ago, when I was talking about the where statement, um, and specifically, I talked about the in operator, which is in this list. Um, this query that we have on the screen looks pretty familiar. We want everything that's in, you know, these SKUs to give us a total. We can rewrite this um, by creating a subquery. And the way we'd figure out what we wanted to do in this case is we're pulling from a department where it's equal to water sports and it gives us this so basically we're running two queries and we can combine the two queries into a single query and i'm just going to get a demonstrate and i'm going to demonstrate using the database you guys have been using for your labs this these two queries should look familiar right for example This query looks familiar. And this query looks familiar. And most of you have probably experienced this one. And that's wrong. Like that. There we go. So that might look familiar to a solution for lab um, seven. Probably one of the last questions. What are they all the airports in Canada? Um, now, this is not the most efficient way to do this, obviously. There's much better ways to do it. And the better way to do it is to do it with a subquery. And there's a few different ways of writing this subquery. I don't know why it's insisting on putting the word all there. So I'm going to show you guys a few different error messages before I get it to work. And then I'll explain to you what this is actually doing. All right, so I'm going to run it like this first. And we are going to get an error message bomb, which is really tiny, but I'll read it to you guys. This off run should contain one column. The problem is I'm pulling two columns, but I'm comparing it, I'm telling it where the country ID is equal to something, but I'm actually pulling back two things, so it doesn't know which one I want to compare it to. So we want to correct it to go to ID. And there we go. It's the exact same result we had before, except now we're running it as two separate queries. Now, the where I'm talking, the other kind of error I'm going to do is this one here. I'm going to select ID from countries without any qualifiers, and I get a new error message. It says the subquery returns more than one row. Returning more than one row is cool if I wasn't trying to make it equal to something. So it's saying where the country ID is equal to whatever the results of this query is, the problem is that can one value be equal to multiple values at the same time? No. It has to be equal to one value. Therefore, if I put in where the country is equal to the name of the country is equal to Canada. We're back to it working because it only returns um hang on, I gotta hit a different button. That that returns just the ID of Canada, therefore country ID is equal to 208. Um if I wanted to go where it's returning um Go like this. I'd have to use the in operator. 
because it's going to return a list. So if I go run, it returned 654 rows. If I run just the inside of this, just show you guys, this returns two values. When it's in, you can hit against multiple targets. When it's equal, it has to be one target. So now let me explain what it's actually, what the whole thing is doing and why it's called a subquery. The subquery concept means it's going to run a query first, take the results, and then pass them to the outer query. Therefore, it's a subquery because it, it's there's a sub piece to this query. So the challenge with subqueries that a lot of people have um, is they don't understand the cost of running a subquery. In this case, this subquery is very cheap because it runs once. So we run the subquery, it runs once, and, well, hang on, I gotta hit the right button. Runs once, returns two rows, the outer query looks at what's being returned. So essentially what it's doing is it's taking this subquery and converting it into that. And then it runs the outer query, so it runs the inner query, figures out the result, basically builds a list, executes the outer query. Um, this is one use for a subquery. This is really handy when you don't know the ID of something. Would I write this particular query, particular query like this? No, not necessarily. I'd prefer doing it as a join. Joins have different performance characteristics. Um, but subqueries are really, really handy for something else. And I'm about to show you this one. Select the sum of elevation. That sounds really stupid. No, actually, let's go like this. Let's go count ID from airports group by country. And country ID. Cool. So now we got a bunch of numbers. You remember last week when I said there's one thing you can't do with an aggregate function, which is aggregate the aggregate, and it says, bro, you're not allowed to do that. Now, what we can do is there's another way of using a subquery. You can use a subquery as a virtual table. So, so far, I showed you guys how to use a subquery as part of a where call. So you're just, you know, using the results of one query to filter the results of another query. And rarely is there actually a need to do that if you're going to do what I'll be talking about in a bit, which is a join. However, if you need to start manipulating results of, of um, aggregates or you need to transform the structure of one table for another table, this is where you start... Uh, using a subquery as a uh, source table. So let's start with this. Select star from. I'm going to open up the parentheses. Close my parentheses. And if I use it, actually, I'm going to run it as is. Actually, like that. And I'll get an error message. The error message reads, every derived table must have its own alias. Remember two weeks ago, two and a half weeks ago, when I talked about aliases, about there's two weeks ago when you could rename columns, theoretically you could rename a table. If you are going to be using a subquery as a table in the from part, the interpreter needs to know what it's called. So what it's doing is it will take that query and do whatever it is you want to do with it. And then it needs a name because it's actually creating a table in memory temporary. It's creating a temporary table in memory. It's going to take the results of that subquery, put them in the temp table, and for the duration of the rest of this query, so let's say you're doing a bunch of other things, it's going to look like a table, it's going to smell like a table, it's like a table, and then the table suddenly doesn't exist anymore. It is born into the world and then disappears instantly. 
it's life is very, very short. Uh, specifically, uh, 0 0.063 seconds to be precise on how long its life is. Actually, it's less than that because that's also included drawing at the screen. Um, but one of the perks we can do with this is I'm going to rename, I'm going to give this an alias also called uh, airport count, comma, country ID. And I'm going to run it. And I'm returning two columns. And now what's cool is I can now go average airport count. Notice I am not doing the aggregate. I'm actually doing the alias. And now I know there's an average of 33.772 airports per country in this database. So this is letting me aggregate the aggregate because I ran the aggregate as one query, passed it to the outside as a second query. So the results are passed out. It acts like it's a normal table. So then I can just run an aggregate against it because as far as it's concerned at this point in time, it is a real table. This allows us to do some other nifty tricks, which will lead me to showing you guys the last place you can use a uh, subquery. You can also include a subquery in the select part of the query. So we know the country ID is one. Um, and as always, MySQL is being super useful. How do I know it's being super useful? It just summarizes the first country. It's not actually a real value. It's just grabbing the first one. Um, however, let's just say I decided to do something a little weird because I want to do the aggregate and I want to know what the airport, the airport is. So of course I'm going to put in the airport ID and uh, country ID, not airport ID, uh, dumbass. Treat ID. Again, I'm back to the point where what the heck is country number two? Is that useful to anybody? No. No. So what we can do is something really nifty. This is known as a correlated subquery. And this, remember earlier I was talking about how you know joins and queries have costs? So far this has been cheap. The query runs in 0.63 seconds. Uh, if I ask it to do an explain, um, explain's a really cool tool. It shows you how it figures out the results. It gives you a little graph on showing how things work. And you'll see that it does a full index scan. It does this. You now here it is creating the materialized, you know, they call it a materialized view in this case. And then it passes the results to the, the outside query block and it does, does the results. So it shows you how much each step costs. It's a nifty feature. Um, but we want to know what the actual country is. So what we can do is go and do this. Select name from country where country.id is equal to, what the heck did I call that? It's subquery, subq.country, that's where id. All right, I'm gonna put this on a couple of lines so you can see um, what it's actually gonna do. There you go. All right. And this is from, so I'm just trying to spread this out a little bit so it's a little easier to read. All right, I'm gonna run it. And it blew up, because uh, it is not country, it's countries. Flight to be country does not exist. Oh, you know. And now we're pulling out the average count of airports or actually the airport count per, and we're also getting the airport name. Now, this is where it's expensive. Uh, I'll run the, the explain again, and now you'll notice how much more crap is in the screen. Right before we didn't have this whole block to the right, this the green with the subquery two and stuff. So what's happening, and the reason why this one is expensive, and you'll notice that we went from we went up about uh, 13 on the count right here and how many you know milliseconds it took to run. The only reason it was this fast is because the database is small. 
So what's happening is the following thing. This query up here, I'm not going to re-explain the subquery here, but this bit right here, every single row that's being returned by the subquery, so this one, if I run this, it returns 240 rows. Cool, right? Not, that one's not hard to understand. If I run everything except for Hello Moto, it's in terrible I know what the ringtones from the phone phones are. The this query is run for every row. So this query is run 240 times. So we are actually running 242 queries to get this result. Because when it's this, when it's up here like this, you'll notice that if this is the country's part, but it's this particular subquery is referring to something outside itself because these parentheses identify one single query that's going to be run. But this query is referring to something outside itself. And it's referring to a value that changes for every result that's being returned. So 240 rows are being returned in the original subquery. So out of those 240 rows, we're asking, can you tell me the name of the country for this row? Row number two, can you tell me the name of the country for this row? Row number three, 240 times. So that means we're running that query 240 times. We are running the subquery once, like the, the primary one that creates a subtable. And then there's the query that builds the whole thing together. So we are running 242 queries for this particular result. Is there a better way to write this? Absolutely. But this allows us, just allows me to show you guys one nifty technique, which is the correlated subquery. Correlated subqueries are very powerful. They're very useful. They're very expensive. Like I said, on 240 rows, it's nothing. If you're looking at a database with a million rows, it's going to be noticeable. Um, correlated subqueries is not something I use regularly. I can honestly say I can probably count on the fingers of one hand how many times I've used it in practice in the last five years. It's not something I do regularly, but that one time when you need to do it is when you need to do it. Um, the good news is for you guys, as far as the exam is concerned, it's not we're only going to talk about the subquery as part of the where clause. Actually, I'm pretty sure the slides don't even talk about these two other ways of using subqueries. And the funny thing is, I find these two uses significantly more important than the one in the where clause. But when students are being told to learn how to use a subquery, they always use them in the where clause because it's the easiest place to use them. It's not the best place to use them, but it's the easiest place to use them. There's uh, usually if you're going to use it in the where clause, um, you're only going to do it because you're trying to match based on strings and not specific IDs that you're aware of. Um, The chronically late crew is also the chronically loud crew. Thank you. Now, that covers every bit of a subquery. Um, the only thing you really need to remember about it is two things. One, it's always in parentheses. If you don't put it in a parentheses, the SQL interpreter doesn't know what to do with it. That's number one. Um, Number two, if you're going to use them, you have to use them in the right place. The cool part about this particular approach here is that we could, in theory, um, use it to populate an insert state. So let's just say we want to put in, uh, create a new table where uh, we need to match 
I don't know, a, the, an airport name with the country, but we just want to create a table for it. What we could do is something like, um, actually, that's not necessarily great. Let's just say I want to create a new table that has only to do with only with the countries. Um, and it's only going to be for countries one through five. Uh, I could go select um, airport. Uh, airports dot name comma uh, from airports. Let's go with that first, right? Airports. Cool. We got that. And let's just say I need to pull data from another table. I could just go select ID from countries where ID is equal to action. No, select name from no, actually let's go with the ID ID from countries where name equal to well, i'm going to use canada again because we know for a fact what that number is we could actually pull ids for an insert statement without ever knowing the actual id as long as we know the values um it's kind of handy when you're migrating data from one system to another where you may not know what the values are or it might be handy if you are creating your data sets for a test and you know you inserted a list of products, you know you inserted um, the parent tables, but you don't know what the ID is, I can't guarantee what the ID is. You could use something like a subquery in place of a value. So you can literally just fit it in using a subquery and just pull a single value and populate it without ever knowing what the actual original IDs are. Um, so yeah, this is subqueries. The subqueries are, like I said, a fairly straightforward concept. It runs one query, gets, gathers the results, feeds it to the outside query. Outside query does whatever it needs to do with it, whether it's in the where clause, it means it's filtering, in the from clause, where it's actually building a virtual table, in the select part, where it's actually just building some data that's being returned. Um, there's a bunch of places you can use it. The most common use, at least for a student's perspective, is in the where clause. Uh, it is often abused by students that don't understand joins. Uh, because students will look at a subquery, they go, I understand what this is doing. It's giving me the ID of this one thing. So therefore, cool. And I think a, a good solid third of this group already used subqueries to answer some of the questions in Lab 7. Uh, probably because they went took some time and uh, did some uh, chat GPT questioning or some uh, stack overflow, which is fine. So some of you have already experienced using subqueries. So it's not that bad. Now I'm going to dive into joins. How many slides did I just skip? The subquery is the title? Yeah, because I didn't give it an alias. So right here I could go... Right now it has a nice name. Is that what you're asking? Yeah. yeah. That's just my SQL returns whatever function, subquery, whatever technique you use to generate the data for that column. If you don't give it an alias, if it's not an actual column name and you don't give it an alias, it returns whatever the what it was. And in this case, it returns the absolutely easiest to read column name, the name of the sub the whole subquery. Um, yeah, that's it. That's why. There's, there's a reason we use aliases. That's one of them. Like, if, for example, if you were writing some code to retrieve rows from the database, have you guys learned about arrays yet? Oh, thank goodness. Okay. When you retrieve rows out of a database using a programming language, regardless of what it is, uh, at one point or another, the result gets turned into an array of some sort. It could be an object that has a bunch of properties, but realistically, it's an array. So picture that this is in Java, it's returning you a row object, and each property of the row object is the name of the column. Now I'm not even gonna to try to write Java because I don't know what the syntax looks like. I haven't written my sites in 20 years. However, one of the properties would be name, so you could go you know, like row, property name, the next one would be row property bracket select ID, that, would, that wouldn't work, right? So therefore you want to give an alias, so then you could go, 
road dot, do, road dot country or road arrow country. Uh, depending on what language you work in, you know, it's a dot, it's an arrow, it's something. So you give it a nice name. That's why you want to alias this. Otherwise, that's totally unusable. Actually, I could use that in PHP, but can't use it in Java. It would break Java because Java is really fussy. Okay. Um, so as I already explained this, subquery, a subquery is a nested query. It's a query within a query. Basically, it runs one, then returns the results. Um, the difference is between a subquery and a join is that the subquery can only ever return um, the results of the top level query. So if it, let's say it's one table with subquery. It can only ever return columns from one table. It doesn't return the columns from the subquery unless you're obviously using it as a derived table. But at that point, you're creating a new table anyway. So you're not actually returning the columns from the original table. You're returning columns from a virtual table. Um, you can use multiple subqueries. You can even nest subqueries. Um, kind of cool. When I first taught this course, the very first time I taught this course, this was a few years ago, 14 years ago. Let's go. Uh, our laptops were not this powerful. Like, you know, most of the students had laptops with like a gig of RAM, two gigs of RAM. <laughs> they were running, uh, actually, I remember a student had a really good one. He had a Core 2 Duo. So he had two cores running at 1.1 megahertz, uh, gigahertz. It was like the most screaming laptop in the class. So I pull up with my, my company supplied laptop. And I just, I wanted to demonstrate running five nested subqueries. So one subquery inside of a subquery inside of a subquery. My laptop blue screen during the lecture because it couldn't handle it because the cost of running the query was so high that my little laptop with two gigs of RAM running Windows Vista <clears throat> died. It ran out of memory trying to run that query because each query was occupying a block of memory uh, passing a bigger block of memory, and it just ate itself to death. And laptop kind of hung. I'm like, huh, this is taking a while, guys. Suddenly the screen turned off. I look at my laptop blue. We didn't have the nice little sad face that Windows gives you now. It was literally the, the blue screen of death that, you know, the memes are from. So, yes, you can use multiple subqueries. Just be aware that there's a price you pay for using multiple subqueries, especially if you're going to nest them. And here's an example of a nested subquery. So you got a query with a subquery with a subquery. Uh, honestly, this is like the stupidest thing you could ever write. Uh, it's terrible, but you can, just because you but you can do it. So what it'll do is it'll run the lowest the lowest most query first, the innermost. So this one first takes the results, passes them to this one, takes the results of that, and then passes it to the outside. So it, it uses up one block of memory. Passes it to the second one, which uses, again, more memory, which passes it again to the next one, which uses more memory. Now, one of the reasons why I talk about the cost, and a lot, a lot of profs don't talk about the cost, is um, have anybody, has anybody in this class ever used any of the cloud services for a project? Explored cloud services. Amazon, Azure, uh, Rackspace. Okay, I got at least one hand. When you set up your instances, some of what happens is you have to pick the size of the instance you're going to fire off. And of course, the bigger the instance, the more it costs you per minute. Because, you know, they charge you basically per minute of CPU activity. So if your CPU hits a certain percentage of usage, they charge you so much for that time while it's doing its thing. And then when it's done, it, you know, the price drops off again. On Amazon, the smallest instance for a database server you can create, it has 512 megabytes of RAM and one CPU core. Your phones are more powerful. I mean, oh, I think my S22 has like eight gigs of RAM, 128 gigs of storage, and I think some like 16 cores. So my phone has, you know, 16 times the horsepower of the smallest instance that Amazon offers. So if you are going to run a query that's really expensive, 
that little instance will either crash or it's going to fix, it's going to slow down to a point where it's unusable, or you're going to max out your CPU credits, and then you're going to pay through the nodes for them because you always get a certain amount of CPU credits so that if you have a really expensive query, you don't have to pay for it. It comes out of the credits that you accumulate through the day, and they always reset. You know, you're only allowed to have so many minutes of CPU credit over the day. And if you write a really expensive query and you burn through a lot of your credits, suddenly your bill is going to go. So, sub queries are cool. They're easy to use. But what's the problem with things that are easy to use? They're easy to abuse. Well, it's true. I mean, hey, you're like, oh, I can write this with a sub query, no problem. Look at that. It runs like a champ. Push it to Amazon. Next month, you have a $1,000 bill. I mean, uh, my, my division at my company, our Amazon bill is $9,000 a month. It's cheaper than buying a server because we're running 26 servers. So, you know, but that's what our bill, that's a small bill. I know a student a few years ago who was doing, he was on the free tier, but he never put a billing alert. And somebody compromised one of his apps and they were writing a lot of expensive queries and he got a bill for $6,000 one month. Um, it took a lot of begging on his behalf to have the bill reduced. They didn't make it go away. So be aware of the cost of what you're doing. So like I said, because it's easy to use, it's also easy to abuse. Which leads me into joints, which would, for almost every example I did today, is a better way of doing it. Like the only thing that the joins can't do is aggregate and aggregate. Like everything I showed so far today, I could have done as a join. <laughs> All right. So in a join operation, and you'll notice we call it an operation. It's not a function. It's a task. It's an operation. It's used to combine parts or entirety of two or more tables. The data stored in individual tables, the relationship between the tables makes, allows you to actually create the join. Uh, there are two kinds of join, an explicit join and an implicit join. The implicit join is the way joins used to be written. So when I went through school, the only way to write a join was an implicit join. We didn't have explicit joins like you guys are about to learn. Um, it was unpleasant. And queries could get overly complicated and hard to read when things are implicit. Um, we are going to talk about implicits first. I'm not a fan of implicit joins. They are very old school. It has nothing to do with the fact that I was traumatized in college over it. Like the day I discovered that they finally created explicit joins and I started using them, I was like the happiest day of my life. Um, but implicit joins are the old way of doing things as most people should try to do. You should try to, you know, stay somewhat modern. So luckily we started having explicit joins in, uh, 1997. So that's the modern way of doing the join, which is actually older than a, probably a significant portion of this room. Uh, I'm not even going to ask how many of you are, were born after 1997, but, uh, you know, I didn't even have kids then, and my youngest is 23. So it gives you an idea of how long we've had explicit joins, which is why I'm not a fan of the implicit joins, because it's technology that goes back 40 years. And there's a lot of things you can't do with implicit joins. So there are different, so there is two styles of joins, but there's a bunch of types of joins. We have natural joins, inner joins, left and right joins, also known as outer joins, full and or cross joins. Full and cross joins are the same thing. So you can mix match join types to your heart's content. I do it on the regular. Uh, I've written some pretty wild queries over the years, and they actually mix match left, right, inner, outer joins, just because that's what needs to happen. Um, out of this list of joints that I never use, natural joints, uh, you couldn't pay me enough to use them. Uh, they are a great way to shoot yourself in the foot. 
Uh, cross joints because I've never needed it. So I just don't write the kind of data I work with doesn't lend itself to cross joints. So joints can be used on tables, on views, on materialized views, and on virtual tables, like the subquery I, I showed you guys, the derived table, you can actually include a join with one of those. So if I remember, by the end of the lecture, I'll write a query that's going to make your eyeballs melt. Because it's going to do everything I talked about today in one query. So the natural join. And by the time I finish reading this slide, I want you guys to think about why I think they're the stupidest things on Earth. Just think about it while I read this slide. Okay. A natural join creates a join based on common attributes, also known as columns or fields, in the tables. In other words, they have the same name and the same data type in both tables. If the requested results, values of common columns are returned once, duplicate columns are eliminated. If there are no column, common column names, a natural join will result into a Cartesian join or a cross join. It looks like such. Select star from table one, natural join table two. Now, can anybody here guess why I have such a problem with natural joins? Because the table, um, if there are two bloody names, it's uh, trouble. Well, yeah, like you got, so let's just say you design your table like this. You've got table A, primary key is ID. We have a name. This is a Varkar 50, right? This is an int. And then we have a bunch of other columns. We have table B. Primary key is called ID. It also has a name column that happens to be a Varkar 50 and a bunch of other attributes. What's it going to join on? Even better. We Even in here, we have A underscore ID, which is an integer, which is our foreign key. But we're doing a natural join. We're telling the database server, you join them whichever way you think is best. It's going to join across the IDs and the names at the same time. Does that strike you as a useful feature? This form of join was very common years ago, before people started quote unquote, standardizing what the different attributes should be called. So if you had a database table called A, and you had the primary key called A ID, then suddenly this would work because it would just go yoink. Cool, because they knew what to join across because the fields were called the same. The second where you have field names that are the same in both tables, even though they're not the same data, that falls over. And you're like, you'll have people go, oh, it's A underscore name, and then it's B underscore name, and B underscore ID. Cool. If the table names are nice and short, it's fine. Let's say our table names is uh, customer product uh, feature add-on. That's one table name. So then this would be what? Customer product feature add-on underscore ID, customer product feature add-on underscore name. It makes the database table name, like the field names, insanely long, just to make sure that you can do a lazy join. Because that's what this is. It's a lazy join. It works with old databases that were designed years ago because that was the common way of designing databases, even though I worked at one company where the design was like that. Then a few years later, I worked at another company, the design was completely different, and these joins would not work there. So, yeah, not a fan of the natural joins. Um, and then we have the cross join, which is the other eh kind of join. This one's kind of cool. I'm actually going to grab a better marker because this marker really sucks. I let me use the crap out of this marker. <laughs> no, it's not here. Hope I've got a marker. I've been forgetting them in my classes. My pile's getting small. So, a cross join. Uh, do you know what? Do you guys know what a Cartesian result is? Did you guys learn about Cartesian results in math? In this would be high school math. You know when you're learning about sets, set sets in math, and you might have learned about a Cartesian product, where you take the results of one set of data, 
you map it to another set of data, and you get a combination of the two sets of data. The best example for a cross join or Cartesian join is a deck of cards. So you know how in a deck of cards, we have sweets and we have values, right? So we have uh, diamonds, uh, club, heart, and spade. Then we've got the ace through king. So the result of a Cartesian join is it would take diamond A, diamond one, diamond two, buh, 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 then be C, C1, C2, buh, 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 and eventually you hit spade ace, spade one, until you hit spade king. And it would literally build the results of both of those sets as a result. It's used for creating matrices. So if you need to create a matrix of data, that's when you use a, a cross join. Um, as you will notice, that last bullet point, this is a logical database word because we only need rows that somehow logically correspond. Rarely have I ever used uh, this concept. I think I used it once because we were trying to build a matrix of features in something. So we want to say, these are all the products and these are all the features. We actually had some where clauses in there to actually reduce um, the result of the uh, the feature sets so that they weren't include too much stuff. But if you had table one had a thousand rows and table two had a thousand rows, you would end up with one thousand to the power of one thousand rows. Not one thousand times one thousand rows. It'd be one thousand to the power of one thousand rows. It's a lot of data. That's not actually very useful. Um, so we got rid of, we got rid of the two stupid kinds of joints first. Um, they serve a purpose, but they're not all that handy. Now, and of course, if you know if somebody who actually works in data science would hear me talk about this stuff, they'd look at me and go, "You're an ass hat." They they do have a purpose. Uh, you know, it, it is what it is, right? Um, I have received flack on some of my recordings where somebody watched my lecture that wasn't in my class, and they actually copied it. Like, That's wrong. It's not wrong for the purpose I'm trying to constantly get across. It probably works for you, but you might work for NASA. You know. Okay, so this is an implicit join. You will notice that it looks an awful lot like the cross join. So we got right here where we got a cross join. We got the implicit join. This part here is exactly the same. The only difference is we're adding stuff from the where cross. Um, so this is grabbing all columns from retail orders and order items where the order numbers match. So it's going to grab all the rows, correlate them, and give you the results. Now, you'll notice that the keyword join does not appear, therefore it's an implicit join. The database server reads this, it understands you're trying to do a join, it figures out how it's supposed to do the join, and then does the join. It has to think a little bit harder about it to achieve the goal. However, um, the issue with this is, unless you're running on Oracle, there is no way to do a left or right join. You cannot do them. Oracle has actually has special syntax, which is how I learned how to do left and right joins. To do a left and right join with this implicit join syntax. Um, it is what it is. Um, I'm not actually going to talk about it very much because I really don't like the syntax because it's really old school and it actually has some performance issues. Because what's happening is it's going to say select star from retail order and order item. It's literally going to read both those tables completely in memory and then go where these two things match. And then it's going to go, okay, now we're going to shuffle through the deck. It does the correlation after reading all the data during part of the filtering process. It's a little more expensive. Uh, here's the an example of a result for that. Um, great. I mean, I can honestly do the exact same thing with my example here. I could go, um, no, I didn't try to save it. Go select uh, star from airports, comma, countries, uh, where airports.country ID is equal to countries.id. And I run it, and it happens. Implicit join. Um, the problem is with the implicit joins is once you start adding um,
you can see where there's suddenly there's some of the problems. So the more tables you join, the bigger your wear clause is getting. And suddenly it starts getting really difficult to understand what the wear is actually doing. Like at this point, the wear is not even filtering anything. It's just telling it, hey, this is how the shit's connected. Fantastic. I run it. Oh, there you go. That took a little longer. I think it's the first time you've seen my laptop hesitate. Right? So that took a little longer. Um, apparently it took uh, 0 0.031 seconds to run it, but it took it 1.6 seconds to actually retrieve the data because I pulled back so much data. Um, it returned 67,424 rows. Cool. That's actually the database you guys are doing your labs with. So some of you are going to experience this, which is cool. So these are implicit joins. Um, now, what I'm doing right now is known as an equijoin, an equivalency join, where one column is equal to the value of another column. Um, what it'll do is it'll return all results where both sets match. And you can do this across three or more tables. Obviously, I just did it with three tables. Uh, I guarantee, I think the second last question, the last question, Lab 9 has you joining almost every single table in that database as a single query. But here's the, tr the cool part. Once you learn how to do one join, you know how to do two joints. Three joints. When you do two, you know how to do three. The second you've got the three, you can do ten. It makes no difference. It's learning that first, the first join. Um, so... You know, that's that's that. So we're we're gonna do now is I'm gonna talk about join on syntax. Join on is the modern way of doing a join. It has severe no uh severe is the wrong word. It has significant performance improvements. Uh why? It's because it starts filtering out the results of the query before it starts filtering them out. So it figures out the, what data needs to be pulled before it ever starts returning results, as opposed to the other way where it grabs all the results first and then filters them. This figures out what it needs before it starts filtering. Um, so the only important, really important topic on this slide is it's considered the proper way, way to write SQL joins now. I am now going to demonstrate these instead of going through the slides, because the slides have a lot of words that is way easier to understand as an example. So I go select star from. So let's go from airports. Okay, that's something you've seen before. Join countries on, and that's not countries, it's countries. Countries on, countries dot ID is equal to airports dot country ID. This is the part when people are learning how to do joins that they find hard. Is this one bit that I just typed. And I run it, and it runs basically the same speed as the other, because again, this is a small database. The syntax itself, uh, let me sweep this to make it a little prettier and easier to read. Um, and for those of you that didn't catch what I just clicked, I just clicked a little broom. That's why I said I'm going to sweep it. It's code for it. You know how in Eclipse you can hit a keystroke and it reformats your code for you? This has the same thing. Uh, it just makes the query really, really long, though, so I tend to use it in my lot. So select star from airports. That, that so far is something you guys understand. There's no issues with this. I'm going to join countries. So I'm saying, okay, I've got airports. I now want to contact countries on and then after that you tell it what the point of commonality is so you say okay i know that the country id in airports is equal to the id of countries so therefore we're going to go we're on and it doesn't make a difference which order you put these two in i could have gone airports on country id is equal to countries dot id or countries dot id equals airport id airport country ID it makes no difference that's cool but basically what this bit here the on clause is telling it this is how they're connected. And like I said before, what this is the point where a lot of students start struggling because they have, they're having a hard time understanding what the foreign key is. Because it's a foreign uh, primary key to a foreign key. 
and you need to know what they're called. So this allows me, as you can see, it's still returned a big pile of records. What I could do though is go uh, airports.name as airport, comma, countries.name as country. And now I've got a nice little query that comes back and gives me the name of the airport and the country it's in. Runs nice and quick. It's understandable. This looks kind of familiar when I did the subquery with the correlated subquery where I was pulling the country name by the country ID. This is a much more elegant way of taking care of that. And remember earlier where I did the uh, the where clause where I went uh, where uh, country ID equal to, you know, select ID from countries. I'm going to rewrite this whole query I had earlier where name is equal to Canada. Why can I not type today? Right? So this looks familiar and I can run it and it works. It's really stupid, but it works. Um, because at this point, we're running a subquery, even though we're already got the, the countries joined in. So what we could do, instead of that, we could simplify this down to, and this is where I'm saying, like, people like to abuse subqueries because they understand that, hey, I can get the ID of the country and just pass that to the other query. Or you could just go like that, which will give me the exact same result. except it doesn't need to run two queries to do it. It does it as one query. Uh, if I were to run the explain on this, just to show you, you'll see that it grabs countries, grabs airports. It's called a nested loop. So what it's doing is it's taking the results of the two, the nested loop goes to the results, correlates them, and outputs the result. If I did this as a subquery, and I run it. Uh, no, this button. Look how much more it needs to do to do this exact same job. Because it needs to run a query, get the result, pass it to the other query. Other query figures out if this is going to work. And then it runs. So the join syntax is much more elegant. And that's a phrase you're going to hear more and more as you progress through your programming career is coming up with elegant solutions. Because sometimes an elegant solution gives you a nice, easy to read solution that somebody else can follow. The join itself is pretty easy to read once you understand what the parts are doing. And you can join as many um, other tables as you want in this, which is cool. I can go join airlines where, no, oh, not that, on airlines.country ID is equal to countries dot ID. And let me go grab, just to prove that it worked. Uh, airlines uh, dot name. Okay, that's one taking a little longer, um, as you might have noticed, because I'm pulling back a fair more amount of stuff. Now, this is not a useful query, by the way. It's actually a really useless query, because what I'm doing is I'm joining, I'm grabbing the airports, connecting to the country, then connecting the airline to the country. So it's basically saying, hey. Here are all the airlines and here's all the airports that's on this country. It's not a useful query, but it's just showing you that you can keep joining through as long as you know the points of commonality. Um, a much more useful query is to join the routes. So for example, uh, you guys probably haven't explored the data that much, but there's something called an airline route, which says the plane takes off here, plane lands there. Um, and that's in this database. 
Um, the reason why I picked airlines as my example was to show you guys that there's something very important about joints that you need to know about. The order of the tables listed is important. You cannot join a table to another table unless it's already in the table list. So I'm going to take, see my airlines right here? I'm going to take that one off and put it here. So you'll notice that airlines is joining countries, not airports. And then I'll run it. And interesting error message that we get. It says, unknown column countries.id and on clause. That's not a very helpful error message. Actual fact, other database servers give you a much better error message than this. This is saying that you're trying to join on a column that it doesn't know about. And the way you figure that out is everything runs from left to right. And by left to right, we are being literal about our character, like literally the text in the query. Because I could write this entire query as one long string, one long row of code. Therefore, I could put in my from airports join, okay, join countries. I'm just going to clean this up a little bit. Join airlines. Now it's really long, but this will work. And it'll work just the same. But it goes from left to right. So things to the right that are being joined, whatever it's joining to must be to its left. Because the whole query goes from character one to the last character left to right, even though there's carriage returns in it. Ignore the carriage returns, it's just left to right. So that's the importance of, if you're gonna do a join, you cannot join a table that is not already in the, like you can't join a table to another table unless that table appears in the query first. Uh, it's like saying, hey, I wanna go through, the easiest example for this is this, okay. Uh, do you guys have any lectures in T119 or T117? Okay. How do you get to T117 from here? You go down the hall. I like that. You go down the hall. It's a very little answer. Thanks. Uh, but can you get into T117 from this room? Literally. You open that door and you step into T119. You cannot. You have to go to the hall first. The join works the same way. If you get to T119, you're going to go T130, join hallway join T117. You can't join T117 to T130 because they're actually connected using the hallway. Therefore, you cannot connect T117 unless there's a hallway there first. Okay? That's the visual. That's the best visual I can give you guys. Hang on, let me just reformat this so, so it's, it's a little easier to read. So on the on clause, can I what? Oh, the, uh, the two sets of columns? Yeah, yeah, that's not a problem. That's not an issue. You can absolutely swap. Like I, I could put, I could rewrite it like this, and that will work. It doesn't care about that. No, there's no, there's no big benefit. So, these are the this, these are known as inner joins. You'll notice that I'm not using the magic keyword inner because the inner keyword is optional. Just like in a left join and right join, it's technically a left outer join or right outer join. The word outer is optional. The words inner and outer are optional. Um, so let's see how many slides I just covered. Uh, yeah, so that's the uh, the uh, join. It's showing, you know, you got to join across the primary keys and the foreign keys. And we can join, um, we can include a column in the where clause. I already demonstrated that. 
and you can join multiple column tables. I just finished showing you guys that. Um, this is just more of the same. So the logic of joins. If you were to actually look at the data, it'll actually try to find the matches by basically shifting the data back and forth. It's sorting the data and lining them up based on the keys. Um, in this case, we've got a student with a locker foreign key of 10. It, it looks for the match and away it goes. Um, so an inner join, and a lot of people like using Venn diagrams to explain how joins work. Venn diagrams are not the right kind of diagram to explain a join properly. Uh, Venn diagrams are for set operations. Joins are not sets. Uh, but at least for an inner join, it works. So on the inner join, which is what I just did, um, what it'll do is it'll give you the results where primary key and the foreign key intersect. So only where both sets match. Thus, it'll in this case, it would just give us a little section of it in green. Um, collecting myself there. I lost my train of thought. It's so distracting. Okay. Uh, hang on. Brain reset. Okay. So on the inner join, it looks for the commonalities when it returns rows at both sides. It's known as an equivalency join, neck join. So it only return results from both tables where the foreign key and the primary keys, or well, at least where the join matches. It's oh, They always have to be both present. Um, a simple example of this would be a, tab a pet table and an owner table. Uh, and if we joined across the IDs, we'd end up with 21 and 22 because 21 and 22 exist in both sets of data and only those rows. The other values of 18, 19, um, and 20 exist in one table. 23, 24, and 25 exist in the other table, but because we're doing an, an inner join, it's only going to come back where they both match. All right. Now, left joins and right joins. Left joins and right joins only return results for the primary table. Let me I'll check out through the slide first. And then I'm pretty sure I've got my data. Well, actually, my data in the airports uh, database actually has examples I can do for you guys. So uh, left outer join returns all the rows from the left table and only matching records from the right table. Remember earlier I was talking about how you read from left to right? This is where the whole left join, right join business starts. Um, if there are no matches from the right table, it returns a null value. So well, let's go back to the whole student locker business. How many students in, again, how many students in here have a locker? I know last time I think it was like one student had a locker. And I don't think they're even here now. Right? So this query in this room is totally useless. But if, let's just say I want to go select all students plus whatever locker for students that have a locker. So I want to know all the students, but I also happen to want to know the locker number for just the students that have a locker. If you're doing a left join, you, it would be written select star from student, left join locker on whatever the, prime, the, the keys are. It would return all of the students and any values from the locker that match. If it doesn't have a value in the locker, it would return a null. And a lot of people go, well, what's the use of one of those kinds of queries? Uh, it is often used in business, actually. Um, let me go see if I can actually get this, get one of these to work. Uh, okay. And then I'm going to go, I'm just going to show uh, airports.name, comma, roots.id. 
I really don't know if this AI even have the data in this to demonstrate it. So this query, just so you know, it's showing the name of all the airports that are used as a destination. And or again, an airplane route has a source, airplane comes off the ground, has a destination, airplane got to where it's supposed to be. And if I, oh, there it's perfect. It actually, I did have it. So these are airports that are never used as a destination. You'll notice that there is no, well, I mean, no route ID. So it's just showing that this airport is never used as a destination. There is no such thing as a destination. So let's say I want to know where routes.id is null. This will return 4,832 rows for airports that are never used as a destination. This is handy. Did you guys have a good little pee break? <laughs> I thought it was girls that went to the bathroom as a group. If they're going to leave as a group, I'm going to make fun of them. I'm not going to make fun of the girls if they go to the bathroom as a group, but I'll make fun of the guys. <laughs> okay. Now that we're all back, um, so what is the use of this kind of a query? This is actually where students ask that question. So why would you want to write this kind of query? Uh, is often used in business when we want to know, for example, what products have not sold recently. So we could write a, a query that goes select star from order lines, join prod left join products where product ID is null, where you know the order date is like say the last month. So we want to know what the products that never sold in the last month. We could actually write it and actually get it to give me a list of all the products that don't have a match. Or all the order lines that don't have a match, you know, you could write this a couple of different ways. It is handy to find missing data. Um, and what's the difference between a left join and a right join? If the left join gives me everything that came from the left, a right join would give me everything from the right with matches from the left. They're just opposites to each other. They do the exact same job, they flip it. I can demonstrate the right join by literally flipping um, routes and airports. And this will give me the exact same result. I just flip the two tables around saying, hey, I want everything from the rightmost table. But the big difference is if I go select star, here's our routes table to the left and everything from the right. If I were to flip these two back the way they were, Uh, yellow, hello? Oh, yeah. Hey, look at that. I forgot to change from left to right. Now we got a proper right join where nothing's working. So if we do left, there's all of our airport data and the nulls, the unmatched rows, are to the right. Literally, if here's the example of seeing where the left to the right, because we, when you do the select star, it grabs everything from the left table, then it grabs everything from the right table, and then the next right table, and the next right table, and it just literally puts them in that order in the results. When I was selecting specific columns, it doesn't care about that order of the columns. It, it doesn't show it. So this will uh, allow you to... Um, identify literally airports that don't have that. So we could actually see uh, how many airports are not used as a source airport. This should be interesting. Uh, there are some that are not used as a source airport, almost the exact same number. That's interesting. Uh, that means that there's airlines that line there, but they never take off from there. Or there's airlines that take off from one place, but never land there. Um, normally, those kinds of airports is one of two kinds of airports. One, 
It's a shut, an airport that's shut down. That, that there's such a thing as airports that are not in use. They're retired airports, let's call them. Um, and uh, some of these are, especially if it has a source, but not a destination, it's a tour airport where airplane takes off, it takes a lap around the city, people take pictures, it lands at the same airport. So it takes off and lands at the same place. So that's a left joint and a right joint. It's interesting uh, in the sense of how you can utilize them and you can mix match these. Um, so for example, I could actually go um, join countries on countries.id is equal to airports.id. Uh, no, that's, that's wrong. Country underscore ID. And he, now I could go um, uh, countries.name, comma, airports.name. And I could tell you that these airports are ones that are never used as a source. And I can tell you the name of the airport and the country. So I've got an inner joint. So it will always return results for countries and airports where there's an exact match between the two. And it'll give me all the results for that combination where the root may be there. Or in this case, the root is not there. It's kind of nifty where you can just keep building up queries slowly. Um, which is where I give you guys a very big pro tip about writing queries, complicated queries. Don't write the whole thing in one go. Bring the results without joining just to see how it works without joining properties. Try that again. Plus, bring the columns without joining to see how looks are taken. Oh, yo, sure, we can uh, hang on. We're going to do a Cartesian join just to make you happy. Because if I don't have the full join, for example, I could, if I did not have all the tables listed, I can't retrieve data from there. But if I'm not using the join on syntax, that means you're asking me to um, do the implicit joins. This should be really interesting as a result uh, because it's going to do a natural join. And if you remember, natural joins join on columns that have common, like on commonly named columns, right? Let's go see how this goes. Oh, this is interesting. How long is this going to take? There. They can watch my memory usage going up. And up. And up. And up. Because I'm not filtering. It's literally joining thousands of rows to thousands of rows to thousands of rows. I'm actually going to stop it because I'm actually going to run out of memory. Um, so you can see that drop. That's just how much memory just ate trying to run that query. So yes, I could do it. Uh, I don't want to lose my recording. But yes, it's totally valid. Actually, I was getting curious because I actually feel the heat start coming off my laptop. Like my laptop's hot to the touch after that because it was working so hard. Uh, if I look at the CPU, you can see how much CPU that... Actually, let me go rerun it so you can just actually witness it. I'm going to run this again. And here's the CPU graphs. Here it goes. And it, because MySQL is single threaded, this that's using CPU too. So if I were to use the uh, uh, you can see right here where I started it. But the, the, the memory graph is uh, happily going up. So, again, natural joins, not cool. Um, and the best part is there's actually columns that match. The ID is the same name in all three tables. It's the same data type. But the CART is still trying to figure out how to do it, and that's why it was using up so much memory. So, yeah. Cool, let's not. <laughs> um, I mean, I could probably go where country ID is equal to uh, 108. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. Yeah, it, that's not going to work. I've really tried. Uh, my laptop's really not happy. Okay. Um, all right, so back to the slides. Over here. All right, so those are left joints. Here's an example. Uh, here's the right joint. It's literally just explaining what I just did with different things. Um, right outer join. Okay, so comparing subqueries to joins. A subquery, both of them join multiple tables. A subquery can only use to retrieve data from a from the topmost table. So the outermost table is the only thing that returns data. You can use a subquery to build up a subset of data. You know. Uh, an SQL join can be used to obtain data from any number of tables, including the topmost table. Uh, as I just did an example, I was retrieving data from three different tables. Um, the last item I'm going to talk about is set theory. And in math, we describe operations on sets where a set is defined as a group of distinct items. Uh, relational database servers, um, because a table that is technically a set of data. Like if you remember what a set of data looks like when you're going through math in high school, you know, it's a grid. What's the other table? Another grid. So you can operate on sets. And usually we use diagrams, so Venn diagrams for sets. Remember I said Venn diagrams are stupid for joins, but they make complete sense with sets. Um, so how many of you know what a Venn diagram is? Do I need to actually go through the slide explaining what a Venn diagram is? Like, no? Some people don't know what Venn diagrams are. Okay. So a Venn diagram is a tool to represent sets visually. And the way it's done is use circles. So that's one set. Um, it's called a student. And then we got another set. Happy. Okay, I'm trying to come up with an example. So these are two representing two different sets of data. And we have spots where the, they overlap between the two sets. And there is three set operations that most database servers support. MySQL finally supports the three major set operations as of last year. Postgres, Oracle, SQL Server, DB2 have had it for, no. Postgres had it for 15 years. SQL Server's had it for 15 years. DB2 and Oracle have had it for 30 years. The only reason why SQL Server and Postgres has only been 15 years, they only started existing 15 years ago. And that's why. In other words, they've had it since day one. MySQL just got it. Like literally, I've earned 8.0.31 bought in the, two, the last two missing set operators they didn't have. So a union. A union is when the is the overlap. Why are all my markers dying? Okay. I'll leave that one as a present for the next feature. So they get the supper. Okay. This is the intersect in a set operation. That's when the data overlaps between the two. That is an intercept. This is um, the union. Union returns everything from set A plus any matches in B that are not in A. So for example, this will return all the students plus anybody else who's happy. This is the intersect is where students that are happy. You notice it's a small subset. So this is this is an intersect. The middle is the intersect. So this is the intersect. The union is everything from here plus unique from here. Except is everything from here 
except what is in here. So it only gives you what's here without what's there. Um, it also, it's also known as a uh, complement. So in base in high school math, they would have called it a complement. So what's here, but not in here. In database terms, uh, no, not there. There we go. Here's the Venn diagrams for everybody's enjoyment. You got set A, set B. Um, the union is the entirety of both tables, but only what's unique between them. The intersection is only what matches between the two. The complement is only what's in A that is also not found in B. It'll never give you anything from B, just anything in A. And how do you write those? <laughs> in database, we have unit, intersect, and accept. Um, unless you're using, working in Oracle, then it's union, intersect, and minus. So Oracle subtracts one set from the other set. So they call it minus. Uh, but it's except. It's the same thing. Um, just different syntax. It's the same thing. Uh, the standard, the SQL standard is you must offer these three union operators. You get to choose what you're going to call them. <laughs> so it's cool. Um, so what do they actually look like? Um, this is what a union would look like. You've got one query, union, other query. Now, when you're doing set operations, there's a couple of very important things you have to remember. One, the number of columns must match. Uh, I don't know if you remember that about sets in high school math where you cannot operate on two differently shaped sets. If one has three columns or three data points and one has two data points, you cannot operate a set operation on that. You can only go with, they have to have the same number of data points and other same number of columns. And database takes it one step further they also have to be the same data type. You cannot do a set operation from an integer to a, to a var car. Why? Because it's not the same kind of data. Therefore, it doesn't know how to do that. So that's a union. This is an intersect. You notice the only difference? It's just one keyword in the difference. One's an intersect and then the accept. So you learn how to do one set operation, you've learned all three. Union, intersect, and accept. And I don't think there's even any union operators. I don't think there's even a set operators at all in the labs. So as far as the uh, set operators, what do you need to know for the exam? Uh, what they're called and what they're used. So you know that a union is union. You know an intersect is intersect. And you know the complement is accept. That's it. That's what you need to know for the exam for this topic. And... Here's another example, um, just in pure SQL without all the extra crap that they like to have on there. Um, so this is interesting, uh, this query, the way I've got this one set up as this example is, this is grabbing a union of everybody who's a customer that is also an employee. So the union will give me all the customers and all the employees and only the unique values from the two sets. It'll give me the first name and last name of all the customers and all our employees. And it's only going to return one version of each. It's the unique versions of those. Intersect will show me who are employees that are also customers. Some of you might be thinking, why would you want to shop where you work? Um, you know, anybody here work at McDonald's? Anybody here buy a meal at McDonald's because you just finished an eight-hour shift and you got to eat before you go home? And use the employee discount. Look at that. You're a customer and an employee. Therefore, you fall under the intersect. Mind blown. I didn't use Tim Hortons because Tim Hortons is a terrible place, terrible place to work. Don't. If you work at Tim Hortons, go work at McDonald's. They'll treat you better. Proof that my daughter's worked at both. That's why I know. Except is saying, give me all the customers except the ones that are employees. So I just want to know all the customers that are not employees. So I can give promos to non-employee customers because odds are, if you're an employee, you're getting a discount. So they shouldn't be get to use the promos. You know, buy one Big Mac, get one Big Mac for free. The employee's already getting the first Big Mac at 50%. So you shouldn't be getting a free one for like quarter of the price, right? Um, so that's the union operator. So now this gets you to the point where you can almost finish the assignment. 
that as of today, you have everything you need for one task one, task two, task three. Task four is about views. It's not, I still have some time. I'm going to cover it really quickly so that those of you that are working on the assignment can just get it off your plate. The last item is creating views. I'll be talking about views next week in more detail, but I will give you guys the short version of the lecture, the five minute summary. A view in a database, you notice I'm not even going to load slides. There's no point. A view in a database is a stored query. So you know how I have, uh, no, not this. Let's go back to MySQL and uh, not this query because that would be terrible. Um, and let's get rid of this. I don't keep, keep fixing, keep fixing. Okay. So I've got this query. Cool. It works. Now, what I can do with a view is uh, source airports as my database prof in college when I went through school would probably be very upset with what I'm about to say. But web browsers were not a thing when I went to school. Like they were just a thing. Like Mosaic 1.0 had come out. Netscape Navigator didn't exist yet. Think of a view as a bookmark. You know how a bookmark in your browser remembers a big long URL as a nice little piece of text? You just click on a little piece of text and magically you get the results. Think of a view as the same thing as a bookmark. You take a complex query, you're going to create a view. It's going to create an object in the database that represents that query. So I'm going to run this and you will notice, uh, oh, there are a few rules and I'll go over that as airport. There we go. Okay, I created a view. You'll notice it says zero rows affected because it created an object. There are no rows affected. But now what's cool is I can go Is that what I called it? No. Darn, what did I call it? Create view that. Eh, yeah, that's right. Okay, let's make sure I actually got it right. There it goes. So I took that long query, I gave it a name. And now this is a view. It is a virtual table. It behaves like a table. I've heard this phrase, right? It looks like a table, it smells like tables, but it's not a table. What it does is every single time you say select star from V source airport, it actually goes inside itself and goes, What's the query that does this? Let's execute this query. And then it runs the query. What I just demonstrated on screen is literally task four of the lab right. of the assignment. Um, it is a pain in the ass. Um, hey, I'll, I'll say the way it is. Someone wrote this. So if you have a GUI, it's easy. If you, I, honestly, I don't remember how to do it in MySQL. Like, to actually type the command to see what defines it, I don't remember how to do it. I'll be honest. Uh, I usually use the GUI, and I can go alter view, and it pulls up the view, and you can look inside of it. So if you're using, whether you're using MySQL Workbench, uh, Data Grip, uh, you know, or if you're working with some other database server other than MySQL, like you're using pgadmin for Postgres, or Microsoft SQL Server's admin tools, or Oracle's admin tools, it will... Um, they, they provide you a tool to see what defines the view. And that's what I do because I work with enough different database servers that I can never remember the syntax because every server does it different on how to pull the view out. Um, there, like next week, I'll show you guys a few things like uh, how to drop the view, how to replace the view, that kind of stuff. But this is the one thing you needed for part four of the assignment. Uh, you will notice, though, as I demonstrated, as I pulled it up, there's a whole more, a lot more crap in there than how I wrote it. Uh, you'll notice it has an algorithm. That's a MySQL specific thing. 
uh, the definer says this is who created this view. Uh, there's an SQL security definer where you can actually set some rules on who's allowed to run the view. You'll notice it even threw in some parentheses to make sure that it's actually doing all the operations properly. It actually, this, the select part is actually how the SQL server, the MySQL actually views their queries. It actually converts them to that inside itself before it tries to do anything. So that's, you know, that's the five minute view lecture. Uh, I'll be talking about them in more detail. You want to see how I did it again? There. You're welcome. So this was the last bit you need, guys need for that assignment. So technically, you have everything you need to finish the assignment now, as of today. Um, yeah. That's about it for today. So uh, next week, I'll be talking about views and indexes. The week after will be the review. Then it's exam. Uh, so again, don't forget, assignment is due on the 9th of August. If it's not submitted, if when you go to demo, you get a goose egg, right? Automatic zero, you have to submit by the ninth. And I've had students in the past say, can I be a little bit late? I'm like, there's one week of school left. There is no more. There is no more time. So August 9th, very important. And that is it.